And I, I now would like to introduce our first uh, panelist today, Sophie King. Uh, she is the president of Global uh, here at Envoy. And in her role, she is responsible for leading uh, the Envoy Global team through an exciting and transform transformative period of growth and expansion while maintaining absolute commitment to the highest levels of service excellence. Sophie has over 20 years of experience in global immigration, mobility, and consulting. Uh, Sophie, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, morning my time, evening your time. Um, and I believe this is uh, actually your first webinar, uh, marketing uh, webinar to our uh, to our audience. So I'd like to um, hand it off to you for a little bit to talk a little bit more about your background and just kind of introduce yourself to our audience. Oh yeah, sure. So uh, it is it is my first Envoy webinar. So thank you for inviting me. And yes, I am in the UK. It's it looks later than it is. It's actually only five o'clock, but it's obviously in winter in the UK, dark pretty early. Um, so yeah, you said it all. Really, I've worked in immigration for twenty something years, uh, which is shocking and a little bit embarrassing to admit to. Uh, I've always worked in corporate immigration. I've always worked in global immigration. So I've never specialised in one country. I've always liked to look at the the whole lot. I think the thing I I like most about it is looking at the patterns and the the trends. And you know, when you do something for a long time, you start to see see things emerging. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, and I uh, yeah, I've worked in a few different immigration companies. I set up a couple of companies of my own. I sold one of them. Then I had another one, and I was consulting actually for Envoy. Uh, on a temporary basis and then I liked the team so much like really this is the truth I like the team so much that I thought I'd stick around so thank you for having me and uh hello everyone it's nice to meet you <laughs> great thank you so much yeah pleasure to have you and looking forward to uh to more uh discussions content like this uh down the line uh, I think we have a lot of uh we have an exciting discussion today and I know down the line we'll have some more exciting uh webinars or other other types of uh, formats to, to to talk global yeah. immigration and global mobility and all that good stuff uh, and then uh, finally, we have a uh, Brendan Coggin. Uh, if you've been on prior webinars, uh, you know he is our Senior Vice President of Global Services at Envoy. Um, he is also a founding partner at Corporate Immigration Partners. Uh, Brendan has more than 10 years of experience uh, managing the complicated corridors of immigration law. Uh, he specializes in global immigration uh, and helps manage a worldwide practice group uh, that focuses on supporting and advising corporations on international immigration strategy. Um, and he ensures that businesses remain in compliance with governments around the world. Uh, Brendan, say thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, you, are, you are out on the West Coast. Um, yeah, how's, 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 your, uh, how's the start to your new year? Yeah, different part of the uh, West Coast than usual up in Seattle today rather than San Francisco where it is actually surprisingly less rainy than it is in um, San Francisco right now, which is almost uh, a little bit of a uh, reprieve uh, for me. But um, anyway, uh, the 2023 is starting off, go, uh, starting off well, things are busy, um, and I'm sure Sophie can attest to the same. There's uh, a lot of things flying around, a lot of folks needing to get um, you know, to A, B, and C. Um, so we're having fun just uh, facilitating all of that while also keeping an eye on all of these just you know rapidly changing circumstances around the globe that we're all um, I know dealing with and uh, looking to accommodate for our employees and the people that we serve so um, all good uh, busy uh, but we like busy and um, you know just looking to get into the year a little bit further nice awesome uh, great so yeah let's hop into our main discussion today uh, again the main topic the the main topic is how to build a successful global immigration program in 2023 and uh, to kick things off uh, part one uh, first Brendan and Sophie just wanted to talk to you about the importance of global immigration yeah especially early on in this new year so Sophie uh, new year new beginnings um, when we talk about global immigration what are we referring to uh, global immigration. I, yeah, I definitely want to just have a good quick answer to this. Global immigration is getting people work permits and visas and residence permits to move from any country in the world to any other country in the world. And I would say that further to that, it is facilitating the entire end-to-end -end process, including not only the work permits and the visas and the residence permits, but also the supporting documentation that you inevitably need to get that stuff done. That's what that's what it is. Great. Um, and follow up to that. Um, do you find that sometimes there is confusion between global immigration and global mobility? Um, maybe can you define the similarities and differences and how those two terms interact with each other? Yeah, I think there can be. And I think it is important to understand 
how they fit together. So global mobility is about it's, it's much wider. Global mobility is the whole process of moving somebody from A to B. So obviously it includes all sorts of other stuff. And actually immigration is often seen as the kind of dry and boring end of things. I think it's a very interesting and riveting part of the process, but not, not everybody does. But you know, global mobility involves boring things like, like immigration, even more boring things like tax, right? But also softer things like cultural, training and language training and settling in services and spousal support and you know all of all of that stuff and we so we do immigration that's what we do and that's what we're good at and we we stick to that one thing but it's really important for us to understand that you know the assignees and the foreign nationals we're working with and obviously their managers and obviously their hr and mobility departments are dealing with a huge massive puzzle of everything so we have to you know keep on reminding ourselves of that so that we're not forgetting about the little bits and pieces and the loose ends and the timing and how all of that fits together because it, it is kind of a giant puzzle. I don't know, Brandon, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, you know, you can consider the difference between global mobility and global immigration just in the way that Sophie described it. It's, you know, global mobility is sort of the umbrella, right, of all these yeah. different prongs of different things that need to happen to move somebody and to keep the company functioning on a global basis immigration being one of those prongs and immigration being the thing that's most closely associated with the government work and, and the things that need to happen there to get the proper authorization to allow somebody to do something. So there is, um, it's a, uh, this is going to, this is going to be my only uh, liquor anecdote of the day on this <laughs> webinar, I promise. Uh, but there was uh, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. That's uh, very similar to the idea of immigration, uh, global immigration and global mobility. Yeah. So, and you know sometimes it overlaps in quite interesting ways so i don't know if anybody listening today is um familiar with the posted worker directive in europe so posted workers is all about sending people on assignment from one country to another country predominantly within the european union and it's not technically an immigration thing actually it's about employment law and kind of equal rights and equal pay for workers but because it has to do with people crossing borders and because it um because it often isn't picked up by by a kind of classic it, it basically it becomes an immigration question it becomes a thing that immigration providers notice and pick up and can actually help i mean we do help with posted workers even though it's not kind of technically and kind of from a purist point of view it's not really immigration it ends up in our court so the lines do blur a little bit from time to time things like town hall registrations and that sort of stuff as well civil registrations they're not really immigration applications because they're not too an immigration department but they're part of an immigration process and it would be totally remiss of an immigration provider to you know sort of refuse to to help with that final piece that that shows that you've got the right status in the right country mm -hmm. i appreciate i appreciate uh the breakdown of, of the two different terms and how they kind of um uh, you know the difference and similarities between the two um you know brendan as we move all along in, in this first part um curious to hear your thoughts on how global immigration has evolved over you know the last five ten fifteen years uh i'm saying five and then earlier today i had a realization that you know we are approaching march 2023 and that's you know, we're almost coming up on three years since uh you know the you know the pandemic started and so much has changed just in these last three years but curious to hear your thoughts about yeah we will how have you seen this space evolve? Yeah, I think when you hear this question, um, Eric, and I'm sure Sophie feels the same, is part of the reason I think that people get into and stay in global immigration is because of the variety and the diversity and the fact that you always need to be on your toes because things are constantly changing. Um, so when you talk about evolution over the course of the last 5, 10, 15 years, I, I'd go, I almost go backwards on what you were saying, Eric, and go, man, how has it evolved in the last three months, right? And yeah. in the last six months and over the course of this pandemic and over the course of the, some of these geopolitical things that we've seen coming up over the course of the last few years and how has that evolved everything. But if you're looking at the, um, if you're looking at the long term, the five, ten, the 10, the 15, um, I'm coming up on 15, I think at some point. So I'll try to, I'll try to vouch for 15 years ago. But there is, the, uh, but there is, um, you know, a few key things. I think the importance of technology is obvious, right? And the evolution of um, just how much uh, programs, governments, service providers, everybody leaning more on technology um, as the as the years have gone on. Um, one of the most, you know, when we talk about technology, usually it's us talking 
our technology, the platform, the things that HRs can interface with and uh, you know get the sense of their population and interact with us and all of those kind of things. But it's important to also think about what governments have done with technology um, over the course of the last number of years. And inherently, immigration has been a very frustrating process for a lot of people because of the amount of physical paperwork, actual visits to consulates and actual visits to ministries, having to mail things back and forth, all of those kind of all of those kind of things that take a lot of effort, take a lot of organization and take a lot of time. Right. And um, as governments have uh, sort of uh, caught up in that regard to some other facets of uh, facets of industry and started digitizing a lot of what they've done um, and how you submit applications and how you get visas associated with your passports and all of those kind of things. Um, it's actually sped up a lot of processes and it's been something that's been a trend um, uh, across the globe for some time. Um, and we saw the pandemic really, you know, give that a kick in the pants, right? It, it sped everything up a little bit uh, because it was necessary. You can't visit a consulate, you can't visit a, a ministry, but you need to get immigration work done. So how are we going to facilitate that? Um, it's definitely been something that's been going on over the course of the last 10, 15 years, but we've seen it kind of hit hyperdrive, rec hyperdrive recently. I think that we would all sort of think that that's going to continue to be the case. Um, a couple of other things that just come up as, uh, as uh, sort of trends or evolutions over the course of time. I think, um, you know, the, uh, the going for some, for some governments, the going away from the idea of just a blanket work permit that applies for everybody and going towards things that are a little bit more tailored um, to the specific type of talent that they want to attract, right? We see that continuing to be refined time and time again, especially, you know, whether it's because of, uh, because it starts with protectionist policies or it starts with non-protectionist policies, one way or the other, um, governments are utilizing uh, immigration regimes a little bit more nimbly uh, uh, to get, to be able to attract the kind of talent that they're actually looking for rather than just saying, okay, anybody that wants to come here has to fit into this, um, you know, this wider blanket. Um, and the other one that I wanted to touch on uh, quickly is just what, uh, what companies are doing um, with, uh, uh, as they're evolving over the course of time and using immigration for different reasons that aren't just because, hey, we want to enter that new market, right? Um, originally, I think the, the main reason and probably still the main reason that you would see uh, uh, companies implementing global immigration programs and utilizing, um, uh, utilizing their programs is because you say, okay, time to expand, time to go to the next place so that we can get more customers or time to go to the next place so that we can get our name out there. Um, more and more so, uh, whether it is because of remote work or it is because you want to develop your own people um, in different ways and, and create a culture that facilitates that kind of um, internal growth, um, immigration is being used to be able to act, attract and retain talent, frankly, right? And so as that's, uh, as that's continued to be something that becomes more and more important, especially during the pandemic and especially as we've gone to um, uh, more remote work uh, benefits, frankly, for folks that maybe want to come on board, um, you know, the, the, the employer utilization of global immigration has evolved over the course of that time as well. Thanks. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so, you know, building off of, you know, some of those benefits, um, you know, maybe there might be some uh, listeners who are looking to build a global immigration program from the ground up or maybe improve upon it. But curious, uh, what, uh, you know, how, just kind of going a little bit more off that, but, you know, let's say I don't have a global immigration program in my company, you know, how can, how can I benefit, uh, what, what are the, some of the other benefits uh, to introducing such program? Yeah, I think pretty much along the lines of some of the things that I was just touching on, um, you know, it really first it often starts out with, OK, we've we're doing pretty well in this place that we started out. Right. Maybe other people would like our product in other countries, too, or maybe they would like our services in other countries, too. Let's give that a shot. And so really being able to get your feet on the ground and being able to get your product or your service or whatever it is that um, your business is running off of. Uh, um, you know, more closely tied to a new customer base or a new population that can, that otherwise wouldn't be introduced. That tends to be for for that kind of expansion. And what comes with that kind of expansion is the need for global immigration. Because when you when you go and you you expand, the things that made you great as a company, you want to make sure that those continue to be um, uh, facilitated in those new destinations too. You want your culture perpetuated in uh, the new jurisdictions. You want folks to understand um, truly your product, uh, you know, all of the company's cornerstones and philosophies, all of those kind of things. And then also the subject matter expertise, right? And the, uh, and the understanding on how to actually make your 
um, sales and your product and your um, in your service work in those jurisdictions. So in, at the time that you decide to expand, you are also deciding in some capacity to go forward with a global immigration program. And then as, as you're going forward too, um, as you want to start utilizing a global immigration program for the uh, for the purposes of um, attracting or retaining talent, then you've got the um, you know then you've got the other uh, then you've got that other motivation in hand. You want to say okay, you want to work from anywhere. We need a global immigration program. If you want to say okay, you can't work from anywhere, but you could work from places where we uh, where we exist already. Well, you need a global immigration program for that. Um, or if you want to say uh, we've we've had clients like this many times that we've uh, that we've helped to you know, for some reason want to have a rotational program, whether that's to develop future managers or to do all these kind of things that, you know, really are helpful for um, uh, the cultures of many companies and the and the growth and the development of their internal stakeholders. Um, you need a global immigration program for that, right? Um, if you want to if you want to send them around. So all of those kinds of uh, motivations tend to be the key ones um, okay. that we see. Sophie, I don't know if there's others that, you know, come to mind um, in particular. But um, those well, tend to be the yeah. I mean, I would say quite often you, you're starting small, right? Like quite often it's not if you know if you're if you're just thinking about building a global immigration program right now, it's it's I mean it's possible and we do see it that you know all of a sudden you need to move 100 people all at once. But quite often it starts small, so it's like one or two people going to one or two places, and you know you don't need like a whole big massive policy and stuff for all that kind of thing. But I would always say you know start as you mean to go, and you don't have to spend a lot of money, and you don't have to spend a huge amount of time, and you don't have to have loads of kind of expert consultants bothering you all over the place. But you do want to just make sure that you know that you've you've built the bookshelf before you start piling stuff up on the floor you know you want to build a structure before you before you before things get messy so just think a little bit about you know how you want things to work and what sort of what sort of things you want to offer and what do you want to do about people who want to work remotely and that that sort of thing um is important to just just consider a little bit first before before you find yourself already in it and and in trouble you know <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I think I think that's um yeah, just going a little bit off of that in the consideration phase. Um, you know, as companies, you know, look to identify and determine those growth options, whether company size or employee uh, population. Uh, how might HR teams go about this? I guess you know how if what questions are you if you're helping an, a, a mobility team build out their program? What questions are you asking them that will help them make those informed decisions? So if someone if someone comes to me or, or to us and says, you know, we're 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 starting to expand and we're moving and we're we're growing, then the first thing we ask them is obviously where where that's happening. And then we ask them um to to what extent, you know, what kind of volume of people do they have moving around and where are they going to and that kind of thing. But then you really want to start looking, I think, you know, there's all the practical things like where are you going and how many people are you sending and what payroll are they going to be on and how much they're going to get paid and what job title are they and all that stuff. Those things affect the practical nature of what type of work permit you can get or or not for the employees but i think it's also really important to consider um kind of cultural and and softer things as well you know so how much do they want to use their immigration program to attract talent or to retain their top talent so how much do they want to think about sponsoring permanent residents and how much do they want to think about yeah, letting people work remotely if that's a legal and compliant option for the people that they're considering and have they thought about cross-border movement within regions you know and if they're trying to send somebody to work in um i don't know in europe but they want to travel all over europe have they thought about which country in the european union might be the best place for them to be located and able you know facilitate the movement around we actually saw a lot of this unfortunately with the uh recent situation in ukraine um because we had clients who were moving people out and didn't have you know they hadn't had predetermined you know um plans about we'd like to open office in germany or, or czechia or something like that you know so it was really a question of like gosh we've got to put these people somewhere where are we going to put them and you start thinking about all of all of that sort of thing so so you can go from the super practical sort of baseline you know like getting people the work permits and visas to thinking about what kind of culture are they trying to build and what are they trying to achieve long term and that's that's quite important to to bake into it and again you don't have to overdo it just think about it a little bit, try and write down a few notes so that you can right. build on it later, you know? Right, right. Yeah, and Brendan, along with this, uh, you know, consideration phase, uh, when 
if you know that if that eight uh, mobility team approaches you about the possibility of expanding to a new jurisdiction, as Sophie mentioned, you know, what are your immediate action items? Yeah, there's a there's a few, and they're along the lines of uh, you know a lot of what Sophie was just mentioning. I will say, um, you know, to the to the earlier question, to this one, Eric, re we're really um, in a good position with a good HR team when they do have that seat at the table early on. Um, so, you know, one of the best scenarios that, uh, you know, we see, and frankly, this is because immigration ends up being sometimes the thing that holds everything up, right? But one of the best situations that um, uh, can exist is where a company knows that they need to expand. Maybe they haven't even decided what jurisdiction that they want to go to next, and they want to incorporate immigration considerations in making those business determinations um, uh, going forward, and then they enlist the help of their uh, service provider or counsel or whatever it might be um, to help to help make those uh, to help make those decisions. And then once there is a decision on um, you know which jurisdiction to to be heading into, there are a few quick things that need to be understood relatively immediately, right? It's you know one, how far along are you in the incorporation of this uh, of this organization of this company? Um, how are you setting up? If you haven't started setting up, how can we help you set up to make sure that you're going to be able to sponsor foreign workers most seamlessly and to be able to take advantage of any programs, um, you know, that might be in place within that uh, within that country to expedite or to make immigration easier, right? Um, some countries have them, some countries don't, but you want to have that on the radar. And sometimes it matters how you're setting up as a as an entity um, to be able to avail yourself of of those um, uh, of those kind of considerations. The next is really an understanding then uh, along the due diligence uh, side of things, what kind of workers are you planning on sending to this uh, uh, sending to this entity? Is this going to be, you know, an engineering office? Is this going to be a sales office? Is this going to be where something is, you know, primarily focused on, you know, management or leadership or something like that? Um, that kind of understanding early on helps instruct us or your service provider, whoever it might be, on what kind of education ultimately you're going to need as the next step of this uh you know of this process as you're rolling out and um you know the third the third prong here really is um you know education right education 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 and in this line of work and in the immigration business expectation setting is key that comes from the education piece of things um so when we're talking about um you know an understanding of how the company is being set up and understanding that um, it is going to be in place to sponsor foreign workers when we're understanding what kind of foreign workers are going to be the intended um, types of people moving over. Um, it's time to actually get the HR and mobility teams up to speed with what immigration looks like in that jurisdiction. It's time to get employees who maybe have already been selected um, also up to speed with what immigration looks like for them. And then um, almost as importantly, uh, as some kind of education going out to all of the stakeholders who maybe aren't going through an immigration process, maybe aren't part of the mobility or HR teams, but are those project managers or those hiring managers or other folks who immigration is going to touch because they have other objectives that they need to hit. Um, but immigration is something that needs to happen before they're going to be able to, to hit those and getting those expectations set there. Um, yeah. So really, when you hear those jurisdiction, when you hear about the new jurisdiction, those are the three things that stick out um in my mind to set that foundation and be able to be able to jump off sorry about that so yeah yeah and it i was just gonna say it relates to what you were saying earlier when you were talking about um how you know things that have changed in the last kind of 10 15 years and how there are more complicated or you know more varied options now than they used to be i think it's really it's really important to remember that because sometimes you know you're trying to set up in a new country and the way you establish your entity you know the way you register your entity and the kind of investment bodies or otherwise that you can register that entity with will facilitate or not the different immigration options you can have so you can't kind of make decision a and then move to decision b in a linear way you have to be looking at it all together because it's not any longer you know as economies develop and as you know uh immigration becomes more of a kind of fundamental part of a country's economy then then naturally are going to be multiple different routes and you're going to want to use the most advantageous ones so you've got to understand some of that stuff before you can make the earlier decisions as well right yeah absolutely yeah yeah um brendan you mentioned uh bringing stakeholders to the table uh you know throughout the throughout this process and you mentioned that not all of them are going to be maybe as close to immigration but they'll be touched by it um in your experience and sophie in your experience who might these stakeholders be uh you know what teams might they be involved or part of and whatnot everyone yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's <It's>, <laughs> every, 
everyone that uh, everyone that has some skin in the game and making whatever the objective is happen. Um, you know, typically, Eric, the what I see um, uh, and I think what we see is the those stakeholders tend to be either hiring managers, right? People that need people added to their team in a given jurisdiction, and that's based on somebody getting their immigration status in place, um, or project managers. Um, you know, folks that. Uh, essentially have closed a deal or have gotten a new customer and have on the, uh, to acquire that customer or to get that deal done, they've made certain promises, right? This is the staff that is going to be on the ground. This is their expertise. Oftentimes those folks are the, uh, are the people that are needing, um, you know, immigration, some form of work authorization um, to get where they need to go. And those, uh, those project managers are the ones who, who are looking to make sure that everything gets um, seen through. It's over, actually, it's it's also an answer to the earlier question of why have an immigration program in the first place. So often we find, and Brandon and I have talked about this before, like often we find that the HR people or the mobility managers that we are working with are quite alone in their organisation. You know, they're typically in quite a small department and they, you know, their, their colleagues quite legitimately and quite understandably don't think about immigration very often because why on earth would they? It's not that interesting to all people and they're busy trying to meet their own objectives. And I think a, a good argument for having a kind of solid and, you know, semi-documented and, you know, something you can talk about, an immigration programme that you can point to and talk about to people, is just to put a little bit of that awareness in the minds of the, of the business so that they know you know, when they're planning something, that at least they should think, oh yeah, immigration might be a thing I need to. <laughs> and then they can come to the HR or to the mobility and they can come to us and we can amplify that voice and make sure it's heard and just try and sort things out a little bit earlier. Yeah. Yeah, so sorry going off that, like, you know, what role do those internal policies play in addition to what you just, just mentioned? Um, you know, should, should, should HR teams, mobility teams, you know, seek to incorporate guidelines like that for their global immigration programs? Well, I love a good policy, you know, so I would say, yeah, you've got to have a policy. But again, I would say don't make your policy. I, th I think you should. I think any company who's sending anybody to anywhere should have an immigration policy because I think it's sensible to write it down. But when I say policy, I don't think you have to have 30, 40 pages, you know, and that, in fact, I think you shouldn't because you'd be too pinned down and you'll get too bogged down in the details and it'd be too complicated and too stressful. But you've got to have something so that you can show to people they need to understand that things take time and that it's important and relevant to be legal and compliant. And actually that's a point I was thinking earlier when, when again, when Brenda was talking about stuff that's changed. For me, one of the things that's really changed in 20 years is 20 years ago, kind of culturally, I would speak to employers all the time who would say things like, well, if he doesn't get his work permit, that's his problem. And now I think the, the government's, you know, change happens both ways, right? It's influenced by industry onto legislation and then legislation also obviously influences industry and I think that's one where it's worked that way around legislation to make companies legally liable and pay penalties and that kind of stuff has has really been listened to and heard and I think I think it's much more common uh, for companies to understand that they have massive skin in the game when it comes to people being compliant or not so yeah I would say you have to have a policy so you can get that message across basically. I'd, I'd agree. And I, I think that the policy also is really helpful for the mobility and HR teams as well when it comes to sort of reeling in um, employees who might want to do a little bit more of their own thing, right? Having yeah. something to actually point to and say, no, this is what the company does, right? Or this is the limit that the company has um, ha has implemented. Uh, it, it can be really helpful in just sort of making things a little more official. Um, as we've seen a lot, and I know Sophie has, as programs have grown, um, or even you know, really from the really from their start, as as global immigration starts to be a thing in a in a given organization, folks really do want to take advantage of it, right? It creates huge opportunities for yeah. employees to know that they can go somewhere, maybe dream location, dream job, whatever it might be, um, and they're going to push to to uh, oftentimes to get that done. And so all of a sudden it can become a little bit unwieldy as that grows if there isn't a policy in place, if there isn't something to point to and say, um, you can do this, but you can't do that. And the, you know, the rationale is, uh, is A, B, and C. If, it is, uh, if there isn't something that's codified and if it is a little bit more like the Wild West, um, it can grow and kind of get hard to reel back in relatively quickly. So also a big fan of having the policy in place. Agree with Sophie, you can't and you don't want to really codify every little detail because there's always going to be folks that need an exception. Um, but when it comes to just having those parameters or those, um, uh, you know, the, basically some barriers 
to folks just running off and doing whatever they want um, <laughs> around the world, basically. Um, you know, that does come in handy for, uh, that does come in handy for programs. Especially with all this remote work stuff. I was on a panel at the IBA in London uh, just before Christmas and some, one of my fellow panelists was laughing about a client of hers who'd uh, had one of those fairly well-known policies, work from anywhere, you know, like remote work, you can work from anywhere. And they'd said to all of their people, you can work from anywhere. And she said they changed it changed it shortly afterwards so you can work from anywhere where it is legally possible <laughs> yeah you've got to think about these things because otherwise people do want to work i mean we're all in our houses with our laptops we we can work from anywhere but you don't want to be getting yourselves into tax and social security you know there's so many issues even apart from the immigration so that stuff has to be sort of tied up you can't you can't predict it all in advance and you can't write it all out in your policy in advance but you can at least point to it and say this is something you need to talk to us about first before you go running off to you know barcelona or athens or something like that totally yeah no i remember when um i think it's the bahamas uh Jamaica, bahamas <laughs> yeah they, sure. they have that remote work visa uh that you could go in and work there uh there's loads now there's loads now. Yeah. actually that was a really interesting example of legislation really quickly reacting to uh cultural influences obviously which usually it's super slow you know i spent yeah. 20 years and people oh well it'll take a long time for the government to catch up with that but in this instance i think because it was financially motivated from an economic point of view certainly with those caribbean countries to start with but then also with a lot of the european ones as well it was pretty quick it was pretty snappy but yeah yeah not completely 100 percent thought through in all cases so certainly a bit of a risky area. yeah <laughs> it interesting to see who was first to market um on those and who maybe was waiting and seeing where there might be some pitfalls to develop <laughs> on their own <laughs> definitely um so as part of this process uh brendan and sophie you know on the topic of like remote work visas and looking at new juris jurisdictions you know how how does the ease of securing a work authorization how might that factor into a, a global immigration program so you know for example we talk a lot about canada um the various uh, immigration programs that programs that they have and i guess how they you know compared to the us at least make it seemingly so much easier to work in the country so as a, a how do companies look at the ease of getting that, those work authorizations and be like well it's easier to go to canada than you know country um, for instance well so I think that there are a few different levels of easy right mm -hmm. one is whether you're going to get your work permits or your visas approved at all or not you know so obviously you have things like the, the cap in the US the h1 cap and that's that's you know you're gonna have to put them somewhere else if you can't put them in the US it's a pretty hard line then there's how easy is it to get the work permit is it going to take six months rather than two months and are you going to have to get a whole load of translations and legalizations and stuff like that those things are not typically factors in my experience for hr because usually they don't know about it until after it's already happening so i would say if you've got a few choices of places that you might be sending people then do talk to somebody who doesn't know about it in advance because they might be able to help you but usually things like annoying things like that things like it taking a long time and being kind of inefficient and, and difficult are things that people put up with and the other thing that i find interesting is that expense the cost of a work permit is usually something that companies swallow so in the uk the government fees have gone through the roof when i first started a work permit cost 95 pounds now you can spend thousands thousands mm -hmm. on a family with all of the extra government fees but it hasn't it doesn't seem to put people off so I think there's there's a huge amount of tolerance actually from from most i mean i don't know if anybody listen this up I, I would be really interested to hear what people have to say about it but i find it surprising how much tolerance there is for inconvenience and inefficiency and and cost compared mm -hmm. to just a, a flat yes or no you know yeah. so when it comes to an individual though it's completely different so i think for an individual person so for, for top talent then i think it's not so much about the easiness of the process but it's about some of the benefits that you can get so about permanent residence and your spouse being able to work and easy transferability between one country and another country and all of that stuff matters and is important so it is relevant obviously for governments to have good immigration programs from from that point of view uh and i and i would say also and then i will stop talking because i think brendan has very interesting comments on it 
but I would say also that I've seen some really successful investment programs in countries like Ireland and Portugal and places like that where the government has dedicated departments to encourage investment into the country who will then facilitate and smooth over that process and that will allow companies to bring people in more quickly and more efficiently and less painfully and I think I think that actually yeah that 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 does that is that is a significant part of of people choosing to be based in in locations like that so I'm, I'm sort of contradicting myself there <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say that I agree with you, Sophie. I, I think a lot of the, um, you know, the biggest, <laughs> at least the very first couple of prompts, the, the, uh, the, the motivation or, you know, what employers are willing to deal with in terms of, you know, the ease of the immigration on the work authorization front, it tends not to be, um, you know, a barrier that a process is relatively harder than elsewhere, but it will draw as uh, HRs get a little bit more familiar with the process. And then they see somebody that's else. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. It, it will draw yeah. an eye roll here or there as they're, as they're coming up. Um, the one thing I would say is that we have seen employers maybe not shy away from a given destination because of how hard it is to get a work up, uh, work permit or the cost. Um, but they may select different people to try to go who maybe don't have to go through that process, right? So choosing your talent pool and saying essentially, oh, okay, we have to, um, you know, we want these people in Spain. If it's a U.S. citizen going to Spain, it has all of those things that Sophie was mentioning, right? Long processing times, legalizations, all these kind of things. Um, maybe we're only going to send EU nationals to Spain to uh, facilitate that uh, facilitate that process and make it easier. So it might not be based necessarily just on the jurisdiction being, um, you know, really difficult, but there might be some adaptation to who we're sending based on, you know, how easy they can have it as compared to others um, going through that process. Yeah, and I guess it kind of goes hand in hand, right? Like a country like Ireland or the UAE or, you know, places like that, which are set up to encourage inward investment and business are going to have good immigration programs, but they're also going to have good other ways to set up your company. And, you know, obviously the UAE has its free trade zones and all of all of all of that type of thing. So it, it it's, it can be hard to kind of separate the immigration aspect of it from the other things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Grab. Uh, so I have, uh, we got about 20 minutes left um, and another set of questions, but you know, on the top, uh, final question in this, in this uh, topic that we've been talk, talking about, um, obviously we want to you know, remain proactive and very and positive about, about things, but Brendan and Sophie, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, you know, what should, HR mobility mobility teams avoid when building their global immigration programs. I'll, I can, I, I'll kick this one off. I, I'm thinking, that, you know, I think I saw the same wheels turning in Sophie's head as, as they were turning in mine, going, "Oh man, what a <laughs> this could be a this could be a long list." I, I think that the um, you know some of the some of the top things that really come to mind for me are first just not putting immigration off. Right. Um, not waiting too long to think about it, to action it. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier on uh, uh, just about sort of the prongs of the mobility process. And often, again, immigration can be that final thing that just holds everything up. Right. And it's uh, there's always there's always a general rule on the immigration side that, OK, as soon as you know that you have a, a go route, kick it off as early as possible. Um, don't hold uh, don't hold on anything. And um, you know, really, don't wait till the last minute to to go that to go that way. So, a policy of making sure that things get kicked off um, as early as possible is, um, I think, really beneficial. And then also, um, you know, really, just this uh, um, when I think about global immigration policies, uh, just as we were describing earlier, you want to have sort of the right combination of flexibility without affording too many exceptions, right? Um, yeah. A policy. A policy all of a sudden that has too many exceptions or uh, if you just as a program are offering too many exceptions to a built-in policy, um, word gets out quick um, and it becomes just as unwieldy as if there was no policy uh, policy there, um, you know, in the first place. So avoiding, uh, avoiding sort of a culture of affording too many exceptions to policies that are in place uh, tends to go a long way in keeping things, um, you know, sort of under control. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's also... Uh you know, a common mistake is to think that because you understand one country's immigration process really well, the others are going to be the same and they never are. So that's the thing as well, just because you know, you know, Canada or Australia or the US or something really, really well doesn't mean that Romania and Switzerland and Germany are all going to be the same way. So that's, that's an important thing. Um, mm 
Yeah. For sure, definitely. Uh, so now, uh, Sophie and Brendan, I want to talk to you. I want to focus on innovation and being adaptable when you know building and maintaining a global immigration program. Uh, so to kick things off, Brendan, you know, obviously no company is the same, uh, you know, from size to uh, size of the workforce to structure and much more. Um, so while we can offer, you know, suggestions um, and templates, et cetera, would you say it's also important for companies to remain adaptable? And if so, what does being adaptable look like? Yeah, um, you know, a resounding yes uh, to that, uh, you know, to the first question. And we've, I don't think there's been another time that we've seen being adaptable more important than recently, right? Through the pandemic, through just rapid fire government changes and regulatory changes. And um, and then also through uh, what we're seeing in Ukraine and what needs to end up happening first, as Sophie was describing before, entire companies moving and entire populations moving um, that there was no plan for uh, initially and, and needing to do that all quickly. So um, in the global immigration space, it is extremely important for companies to remain uh, adaptable. There are um, almost 200 countries. They all have their own rules, the, although those all of those rules are changing all of the time. Um, and that can impact essentially what a uh, what a company's plan was going into, um, you know, any kind of project or any kind of initiative um, in any one of those countries uh, going forward. Um, being adaptable can take a lot of different forms, and it really does oftentimes depend on what your industry is, what your population makeup is, um, and where you're situated and what you're located and what your plan is. What, what are you looking to do on the uh, uh, in the international space? But a lot of it, if I'm thinking about it, has to come with just being a, uh, being willing um, to actually try new things. Uh, really, as a as a program, being willing to take examples from um, similarly situated companies in your industry, being willing to take maybe some maybe some uh, uh, tips and tricks from those maybe not in your industry or not of your size, and really formulating a tailored program that is specific to your uh, to your uh, company. And so, you know, we see this a lot in our uh, in our practice. It's a it's a big initiative at the early set uh, at the early stages of working with an organization to really get a sense of the culture. What are the things that the company is doing? Um, what are the plans for expansion? And what are the plans for um, you know any other business goal initiatives that are that are coming down the pipe? Um, what do we see other organizations that maybe are in that same space do very successfully? What have we seen the pitfalls be? Um, and then essentially creating a program that is tailored around that company, but also allows for room of uh, flexibility and some trial and error um, because every indi every individual organization is just different. Um, no two companies are the same, no two programs are the same, and everybody does from a very early, sta uh, early stage have to understand that. And in this dynamic global immigration space, it becomes even more important to just be, be willing to say, okay, this is what we have in place. This is what we want to try. You give it a try. You see what works. You see what doesn't work. And you continue to build the program. You continue to strengthen the program. You continue to improve it. Um, I'm, I'm willing to say that there's never a settled state for this kind of thing. It's really something that everybody has to be willing to continue to improve and adjust over time. And those companies that are adaptable that way and flexible that way tend to have the best, most robust programs um, because they continue to sort of um, uh, fortify their, their program over time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously there's some things you can't adapt, right? You can't adapt the legislation as a company. You can't adapt what you have to do to be compliant with the law. So you have to fit to that. And because of that, you have to be adaptable yourself. You know, if you can't change something, you have to fit around it. So so you have to be and it's relatively easy to have a kind of structured and fixed process if you're sending people only from one place to one other place you know if you send all of if all of the people you're moving are going from say india to the uk then you can understand which route they fall into you can have a very nice set up and organized process until the legislation changes and then you have to be very quick to adapt it <clears throat> you're not necessarily going to get that much notice of it changing and then the minute you start to add some other people you think well maybe i'll send some people from singapore or maybe i might send a couple of people from the us then that changes things too and that that's where i think people sometimes trip up it's the same thing like if you if you feel like you know one country really well you might fall into the trap of thinking you know others well it's also the same with home countries you might know the uk really well but you send somebody from a different home location suddenly the timing is all out of whack and the interview system is is different and that kind of thing so you have to you know i mean i would i i always think people should be adaptable but you do want to try and fix down 
what you can so that you know what it is and you can build processes around it and that kind of thing but you've always got to be you do have to be prepared to just change it all up at short notice <laughs> yeah definitely. <clears throat> yes definitely uh, as part of you know that adaptability following the process of uh, both of you mentioned earlier uh the growing importance of uh, of technology immigration technology um curious to hear your thoughts of how maybe expanding a little bit more on it of how immigration technology fits into a company's global immigration program um so people start with you and then um brendan so i love technology um you know i've built software myself in the past and and sold it and i i love envoys technology and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to work here also the people that was true too <laughs> um but yeah you know i think i think the covid pandemic really highlighted some of the things that technology you know all of a sudden everybody was like gosh where are my people like where are they and what jobs are they in and can i extend their visas and can I, should i bring them home you know they needed to know where they were so on a very fundamental basis technology is very important for tracking where your people are and what status they're in and when when you next probably need to do something about them but then you go from that which is kind of fundamental and crucial to your global compliance to it just also making your life much easier. I always think when people talk about technology, it was a separate thing. That's um, a bit of a, a sort of mislabeling of what tech actually is, because actually now, you know, in 2023, technology is everywhere. Like everything we ever do is facilitated by technology and the best technology is invisible and you don't even notice it. You don't think when you text your mum, you don't think, oh, I'm using some technology now. I better get ready for the technology I'm about to. You know, it should be, completely unnoticeable and the best technology for immigration is the same way so it should be that you know you're submitting the information the data that you need to your service provider in a way that feels easy and normal and natural and you should also be able to get the information that you need out of there you should be able to tech is amazing at communicating you should be able to communicate what's happening and what's needed and all that kind of stuff in a quicker and better way and you shouldn't notice that it's a tech solution that's doing that for you so yeah that's that's what i think about it it should bring everyone closer, really. A hundred percent across the board on uh, on what Sophie was just mentioning. And I think, you know, when you talk about companies that want to have a global immigration practice or program, what everybody is also really asking for is being able to get their arms around something, right? Your population, your uh, the manner in which you're handling compliance, all of those kind of things. And really, as a uh, as a global immigration program, looking for that visibility and transparency, technology facilitates that, right? It's the it's the pathway for you to be able to see that entire population that Sophie was mentioning. It's your ability to see, um, you know, who has expiring status documents coming up. Can this person work in one place or another? Being able to have just a, a repository or a source of all of that information um, in one place is sort of part parcel of the purpose of a global immigration program. Right? You want to have everything um, yeah. centralized and you want to understand everything that's going around there. I'd be remiss just quickly to uh, uh, to not mention, you know, on the technology side, there's also this increasing uh, awareness, I think, around um, all industry about uh, the privacy and security of, of people's yeah. personal information right, and documentation. And um, this isn't something that's immigration specific, but it touches immigration a lot because of how much PII, personally identifiable information, there is associated with immigration processes. Technology, um, you know, on one end is the problem uh, with that kind of stuff starting around. So um, fully aware, but on the other, end, it's also the solution, right? And being able to share um, the type of information that, you know, is that PII or is sensitive or, you know, whatever it might be um, in a secure way, uh, you know, technology ac accommodates that in today's world, which is becoming more and more important. That is exactly what it is. So tech is all, tech is about, thinking of the problems that you have and then thinking of the solutions that you need for those problems and then thinking of the best way to resolve those and one element of the resolution is always going to be tech so all of the stuff we've been talking about for the last 52 minutes the tech is an element of that so if you're thinking about like how do i make sure i'm talking to my service provider about the countries that we might move into next year because i don't even know what those countries are because my colleagues don't always tell me everything tech is a part of that because if you have good tech and you've got people in there looking up information and trying to find out then you can you can to some extent predict you know you can look at the populations that you've had moving before you can look at the countries people are searching for and the information people are looking up and you can start to think oh 
this guy keeps looking at Romania all the time. He must be planning a project in Romania. You know, so you can use tech for, for that type of thing or for a policy. You know, you can write a policy in a Word document, which I guess is a form of tech, but you can communicate that out to people and make sure that they can see it and comment on it and feedback to you and read it and absorb it. That's a, a tech enabled solution as well. So that's 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 what it is all about, I think. Thinking thinking of the solutions to the problems and then how tech can make them easier and quicker. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So uh, we got about five minutes left. Um, and as we look, we're close to wrapping uh, things up for the day. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, you know, having those guidelines, uh, you know, a process in place, but also remaining adaptable because as we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, things can change on a whim. Uh, so if you mentioned, you know, legislation coming through various governments that might, uh, uh, you know, switch things up, um, as well as including other stakeholders that might be touched by immigration in some way or another. Um, and then, you know, the tech aspect of it and, you know, remaining adaptable. Um, you know, I'm just curious to hear uh, both of your parting thoughts, um, you know, on just the, the question of, you know, how to build a global immigration program in 2023. Yeah. Anything that we missed or anything to you wish to expand upon? Um, and Brendan, we'll start with you. Um, it'd be tough to expand on a lot of what we went over, uh, what we've gone over so far. We're, we're giving out a lot of uh, a lot of info here. Uh, but. You know, in terms of just the, uh, you know, in today's times, in 2023, growing out or building out a global immigration program, I think the the main thing that you want to consider is just always this idea of building the foundation, right? Building what you're going to jump off of when you actually do have individuals that need to meet a date or do have a project that needs to be hit. Um, and that foundation generally consists of a lot of what we talked about today. It's the education, it's the understanding how immigration works, it's the setting up of that policy and then it's making clear to the rest of the organization that all of this exists, right? And that we have this uh, that we have this plan and this framework in place. We're going to follow it. We're going to funnel things through it as we are going forward with this um, with this expansion. I will say that it's really common um, in the space, and this is you know not a uh, uh, this is probably not a secret. It's really common throughout the space that global immigration kind of just happens all of a sudden for for companies, right? It's not something that was necessarily thought out. It's not something that was even necessarily contemplated. It's kind of like, oh shoot, all of a sudden we have something that's going on in the UK, we're a US company and we need to get somebody out there immediately. Now you're in the global immigration game, right? So if you have the ability to get a seat at the table earlier on and you have the ability to set up this foundation, these jumping off points, um, your organization will be that much better for it and it'll be scalable, right? It'll be something that you can immediately um, do across uh, across the globe in, in different ways. So, um, you know, foundation, education, uh, that's what I'd go with in 2023. Yeah. Um, so I was I was talking to our colleague Jenny um, yesterday, and she about something completely different. And she said to me a phrase which I have not heard before. She said, "You don't you don't you have to eat the elephant one piece at a time." I don't know if that is a common phrase for Americans because we don't eat elephants. In my Relatively, <laughs> never heard that one. <laughs> yeah. Sure, you can only eat the elephant one piece at a time. But that's the thing. I think the thing is to not be scared of it. You know. And to not be, you know, not try and do it all at the same time, to start slowly and also to not be embarrassed or worried. Like so often I have clients saying to me, I'm, you know, oh, gosh, you must think we're awful because we haven't done it. You know, you must think we're terrible. I'm like, no, never. You wouldn't believe how many companies haven't got their stuff together, you know. So really, it's OK. It's OK to be a bit confused and a bit stressed and a bit worried that people might be doing the wrong thing in the wrong place. And it's totally fixable if you uh, uh, eat it one piece at a time. <laughs> is, it, is it not a thing people say? <laughs> Just I've, heard it. I, I've heard it, it's not, it's not completely made up. <laughs> I can't say that I've heard that one before. So today I learned, today I learned. Uh, no, but yeah, no, I think those are both great responses um, to, to, to kind of, you know, sum it all together. And final question for both of you and Sophie, we'll start with you. Um, you know, we're still early, still, still early in the year. I'm um, curious to hear, you know, what are your, what are you anticipating or hoping to see from global immigration um, in the larger global mobility sphere um, in 2023? I'm hoping to see a continuation of legislation moving quickly in response to corporate demand. I'm quite excited about that. 
I don't think we'll see huge changes in 2023, but I hope that the trajectory that we're seeing there continues the way that it is. And I'm hoping that we'll see continued, the other thing that has happened over the last 20 years and continues to pick up pace is the understanding of corporations about the complexity of the area and what they can, how they how they need to interact with that. And I think that that will continue in 2023 and beyond, obviously, as well. And I'm just crossing my fingers. I've been on webinars and panels and that sort of thing for the last several years and I've predicted that Brexit wouldn't happen, that COVID was not going to be a big deal, that everything would be totally fine in Eastern Europe and beyond. And I'm always wrong. So I'm not going to make any predictions about anything that I can jinx with my with my bad prediction skills. That's that's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't want just don't ask me that sort of question. <laughs> Fair, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Brendan, what are uh, what are you what are you anticipating or, or hoping to see uh, this year? Yeah, um, you know, I share uh, uh, Sophie's sentiment in terms of um, you know more nimble government regulatory changes, um, you know, better accommodating the needs and the actual uh, the actual desires of um, you know companies, employees, and the people that really are bringing things to those economies. Um, if there, if we saw one thing during the pandemic, uh, it was very quick government action and rule changes and being able to um, roll out things quickly and um, and effectuate those changes, right? And so there's, uh, it stands to reason that some of those things could happen elsewhere too to ease immigration uh, a, a bit. Um, you know, the other thing I'm hoping uh, uh, that I think we all would love to see is further adoption of technology by governments, right? In that trend that we've uh, in that trend that we've been yeah. seeing, and um, you know, helping facilitate and ease that process as well. Um, Australia always comes to mind for me when thinking about this. When um, I remember, even you know, very early on in my career, getting uh, helping get visas for folks to Australia, and you just you, met, you have the realization that no paperwork has exchanged hands, and the visas. Yeah, it was on all like, oh, yeah, it's invisible. Yeah, you don't have to send your passport anywhere. You just travel once they say you're approved. And if there if they if there are um, government regimes that can do that, um, you know, again, it stands to reason that that can that can ha happen elsewhere and really streamline processes. So um, I think I'm optimistic about governments adopting technology further. I'm not sure how quickly that will happen. If that's a 2023 question, but um, you know, really something that we're looking towards. Awesome. I think those are those are excellent uh, hopes and dreams. Uh, Sophie, that's a good reminder. Yeah, I won't ask you about actually predicting things. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> just <that. laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, awesome. Uh, but yeah, with that, uh, we will wrap things up for the day. Uh, I know we're a little bit, uh, a couple minutes over, so really appreciate uh, Sophie and Brendan, both of you hopping on this morning and uh, evening um, to to participate in our first webinar of 2023 in this uh, in this new format. Excited for things to come. Uh, to our attendees, thank you so much for joining us, uh, wherever you may be located. Uh, this recording will be sent out in the, in the following days, so please keep an eye out on that email. And we hope to see you on uh, future future webinars. And uh, you know, please interact with us on social. Uh, Brendan and Sophie are very active on LinkedIn. Uh, happy to, um, as well as a company, uh, we're, uh, we're posting stuff every day. So please follow us, and uh, we'll see you around. So with that. Take care. Have a good rest of your day. Have a good evening, Sophie, and uh, we'll see everyone later. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. Take care.